Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 315 of the Daily P for Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, February 12th, 2024, and it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. We have a little bit of a bite for you on this Monday morning, but uh, first, let's thank our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Carvin Moon Publishing and CanadianTarot.com, and ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, good morning, Mr. Beaver, and mental health-wise, I think I'm doing pretty good, honestly. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have the greatest night's sleep, but uh, woke up feeling ready to take on the world. Whether or, whether or not I have the energy to do that is different, but I felt like taking on the world. So, <laughs> ah, Good, good, good. Good, good, good. We like that. We love it, energetic grizzly. Well, you know, I try from time to time, and occasionally I do succeed. <laughs> I fail more than I succeed, but that's okay. Ah. I'm, I'm, I'm only human. All right. Uh, good morning to the kids who have joined us. Kit Ellen, Kit Elaine, Kit Wishful, hello. Kit Jillian, Kit Dan, Kit Kendra, Kit Hugh, Kit Cassie, Kit Linda M. Also joining us. And of course, Austin, who apparently just farted on Dan. So there you go. <laughs> Dogs do that sometimes. Dogs you know. do do that. <laughs> oh, Kit Mike H. popping in with the morning all. Morning to you too. Um, I am doing well. I, uh, had a great weekend, had a mm. wonderful podcast, um, had a bit of an adventure getting home. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Nice of them to let you know. Oh, by the way, we've moved the stop. You just, it's in this little tiny print down here that if you don't, you know, that, like super, super tiny, tiny little print with like no bold letters, nothing on it saying, Hey, you might want to look here. Nothing that would, cause you know. Yeah. If you ride an intercity bus or ride an intercity train, now it's hard for them to move the train station on you. Yeah. But intercity bus, um, when you always take the same bus, you just get your ticket, say the ticket came in, and then yeah. you just go to your bus stop. Well, apparently they moved the bus stop. And didn't didn't really make a big deal about it by, you know, that was informing that, people. It's actually written on the ticket, oh, yeah? the same part that you would see normally on the ticket, but there's nothing saying, hey, but when you take the bus all the time, you get the confirmation email. I see my QR code. They say, mm -hmm. I got to take. I don't press on it to read the ticket. No, they, they should have. A because I have taken this bus many, many, many yeah. times now. So it's just, okay, my, I, I, I got the confirmation email. I know where to go. Well, I, and I wasn't the only one. There were four of us. Yeah, that's I, think, I think somebody might have been there to pick someone up. <laughs> uh, maybe. But, uh, but there were four of us there. And uh, I was... Super proud of myself because I'd actually gotten to the stop before the bus was there. 
So I'm thinking, like, look at me, man. I am so organized. Because normally I get there and the bus is still waiting and people are boarding because it's literally seven minutes walk from my place. Right. But I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I'm up a little early. It's not cold out. So I'm not about like minus 15. I can wait outside. Mm-hmm. So I'm there like this. And, you know, and the bus stop was like, wow, it's not even here yet, man. I am so organized. Man, all the people at the rehearsals in Kingston that I'm supposed to go to are going to be so impressed with me. <laughs> Getting my shit together like that. And it's like, well, the bus should be here by now. And I'm like looking at it on the, the GPS thing. And it's in the area. Mm-hmm. Sort of, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, it's just running a little late and, you know, doing more stuff. And then it's like, okay, it really should have been here by now. And then I'm looking at it and the bus is going the wrong way. <laughs> I'm like, what? but you haven't picked us up yet. Why are you already on the road? And then one of the four people turned around at some point we were talking to each other and says, well, yeah, I saw the thing. It said 200 commissioner, right? This is commissioner. It's like, no, this is 83 George. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference. The 200 commissioner is about a 15 to 20 minute walk away. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to think. Like, I actually would have had to take a bus to get to the bus pickup spot, which means that my planning departure time from my condo would have mm-hmm. been completely different. But apparently all we get is we got the big confirmation and there's like tiny, 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 tiny little letters that say where the new plane is. And with nothing saying, hey, you might want to be aware that we moved your stop. That's the thing. Just just when, when, when you purchased your ticket, they should say, please take note. The location for your pickup has changed. Yeah, and that like should be on like for some like six months because not everybody takes it twice a week or every week. Mm-hmm. Like some people just take it once a quarter. But it's like, but like when you're booking, you know, it's like Ottawa to Kingston. Please note, like right on the booking page, you could put it there. Yeah. When you get yeah. your confirmation email, Agreed. please note on your ticket, uh, put a big circle on it, put some like flashes, like here it is. Like remember, nothing. Well, in, in their defense, on the, and on the website itself, it says. Says the bus now now stops here, mm-hmm. not your pickup spot has changed. So it's sort of like, well, it's a little misleading. Uh, well, back in the day when I used to come back from Montreal, the bus would stop at the University of Ottawa before going to the terminus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some buses wouldn't, and they would tell you. So it's like, okay, so the bus stops here now. Great, you know, for people who are getting off at that part of downtown, they mm-hmm. you know they can get off the bus. Great. It doesn't say the bus doesn't go. Or pick up from it anymore. It just says it stops here now. <laughs> yeah. Which is like, I mean, in their defense, great. they did they did tell you, but they didn't make it blatantly obvious. Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, you can't say you didn't they didn't tell you, but it's like, but there was absolutely nothing that would draw your attention to it mm-hmm. whatsoever. And that's um, that's the that's the mistake on their part for sure. Like it should be blatantly obvious. Yes. So a thirty two dollar ride home ended up costing me over a hundred. Well, that sucks. Because I had to buy another ticket because I still yeah. had to get back. Yeah. And of course, that ticket was bought at the last minute, less than an hour before departure. Yeah. And that was Megabus or Flixbus? Uh, the Flixbus is the one I got screwed on. Megabus got me home. Okay. I haven't traveled either one of them yet, but yeah, maybe someday. Yeah. I'm more of a train guy myself. The actual service on the bus is not bad on either of them. Yeah, quite yeah, good yeah, yeah. like i said they pick up from two different places and they have two different schedules and sometimes one's more convenient than the other but and i uh, noticed their pricing is different too because I, yep. I was checking stuff out it's like sometimes flix is cheaper than mega and sometimes it's the other way around so yeah exactly miss. exactly so i'm like sitting there and like so i wrote on twitter about it and they said oh you know oh we're so sorry that you were inconvenienced we're constantly optimizing our schedules uh we hope that uh, we have a chance uh, don't get up to you well, no, not to make it up to you, but to, to show you that our service is reliable again. Oh. Okay. And to help me with that, you will. And then, I, so I wrote back again and I said, well, you know, it's like, you know, you probably should have like made something like bigger. And, you know, and was, we'll forward that on to someone, but, uh, we, and we hope that you ride with us again. Yeah, that's easier. You're not getting anything. <laughs> it was sort of like, um, so I, I just wrote as a normally, when somebody has a terrible customer service mm-hmm. experience like that, a company usually does something to incentivize someone to attempt their product or service again, particularly when there's an alternative in the market that someone could go to. Which or I did. Of us. Yeah. It's like, 
really? And then I got, oh, well, yeah, write something here and maybe pull. So they weren't going to proactively offer it. No, 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 of course not. You know, it's like, it's like, it took your money, but you didn't get to ride. <laughs> I was like, hello. Really? Mm -hmm. And there are four of us. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's their, like if that's it was their only, if it was only me, that would be one thing. Yeah. yeah. Going around, well, gee, you should have known everybody else did, but there were four of us. Yeah. yeah. Four of us don't make the same mistake unless there's something wrong at your end. Yeah, this is uh, what Linda's saying here. It sounds like they've gotten this feedback before and decided they're not giving out any more compensation. And I think that sounds about right. That could be the case. But anyway, I am going to send that little letter to them and say, um, yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, people these days, like often they don't refund. They just give you a credit. It's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, I am going to be going back at some time. Yeah, yeah. You, you could put the value of that on an account and, you know, because, hey, hopefully you'll ride with us again. We've credited your account. <laughs> Please ride with us again. Give us a chance to make it up to you. <laughs> I guess. Not. I swear, man. It's like no. PR 101. If somebody took the time to actually write about it in a public forum where everyone can see it, show yourselves being a mm -hmm. good the amount of benefit, oh, well, look at this. The company proactively offered him something. Like, that's worth a lot of dollars in advertising, way more than the $32 for the ticket. It's like, you missed an opportunity here, people. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, <sighs> catching, uh, I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl at all last night. Um, I normally do not watch the Super Bowl. I only watch for the halftime performance most of the time. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. of course, you know, the really tight pants. Um, and, uh, but yesterday I was, uh, out with my beaver sweetie and I saw at one point that it was, uh, the 49ers that were winning. And then I saw at one point later on, it's like, oh, they're starting to come back. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I looked bef just before I was going to go to bed. Oh, it's 16, 16. There's only five minutes left. I guess I'll tune in, watch some Super Bowl for the first time to see what's going on because, and I wasn't going to watch for the football, really, because I'm a political guy, and I'm thinking, mm -hmm. you know what, you know, everybody's making these jokes. Oh, yeah, the Chiefs are going to lose, and then Taylor Swift is going to dump him, and then she's going to write a song about it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I don't know about you, but I don't want this to end. <laughs> I don't want a song right now, because, yeah. I mean, just her being around is causing such epic meltdowns. So I With figured I'd watch the, I, yeah, I figured I'd watch the end of it. And uh, I have to say, first of all, I've never seen five minutes take so long <laughs> for so to end the game. That's but then, of course, incredible. they had uh, the overtime for with with new rules in the NFL for the first time. And I, I don't know much about football, but I actually like that rule that you know both teams get a possession. If it's well, it's, tied, then it's, it's the first not score. exactly the rule though. That's well, the CFL. Both teams get a possession in the NFL. So let's say if. If Kansas City kicks the ball off to San Fran and San Fran runs it in for a touchdown, game is over. Yes. Sudden death in that sense. In that if sense, they yes. score a field goal, which is what they did, the game carries on. Mm -hmm. So if if uh, Kansas City had a kicked a field goal instead of scoring a touchdown, they just would have went on to another 15 minutes of play. Yes. Yep. Right. So, uh, but I'm uh, watching that and then I'm like, okay, you know, all of a sudden, you need to be a big play, and then there's that 22 yard catch by Kelsey, mm -hmm. which then allows for that first down to 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 happen. And then they get to first and goal, and I'm sitting there. And it's like somebody's again. I don't know much about football, but somebody's got to go wide into a corner and just like pitch one to him. And of course, Mahomes does that that, that little deke move that gets the the guy that was mm -hmm. covering him to look the other way he kind of disappeared behind the crowd and then bolted right to the corner and boom, we got a path. I was like, gee, maybe I should be a football coach. <laughs> because they did exactly what I thought they should do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was kind of happy, not only because, well, first of all, Chiefs have won two in a row, and that's the mm -hmm. first time since, uh, I think, 2003, 2004, the Patriots. That's right. Yeah. Uh, have won two in, two in a row, and they have a chance to uh, – make it three, which is very rare. As I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's ever happened or has it happened just well, once. The Steelers won, I think, four in a row back in the 70s, yeah. if memory serves. Yeah. Um, so, but now I'm just like sitting there like, 
Hold on to your hats, folks, because there's going to be an epic Taylor meltdown and see all the people go, she did it. She won the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm thinking that's going to piss a lot of people off right there. Well, that's why I said congratulations <laughs> to Taylor Swift and the Kansas City uh, team for winning the Super Bowl. Yes. And uh, and I to- totally missed Usher. It was, it was, he put on a good show. It was entertaining. Uh, and he had a lot of people out there with him, Little John and... and um, mm. Alicia Keys, her, uh, yeah, it was good. It was, it was, they put on a good show. I really enjoyed it. The, it was the most entertaining part of the first half of the game because the first half was boring. The first quarter was a shutout, no score mm. after the first 15 minutes. Um, the, the fourth quarter was the whole game and overtime because okay. up until that point, it was a snore fest, man. It really was boring. As okay. hell. It's kind of like a few years back when everybody says, oh, the greatest game ever was when, uh, when uh, it was it was the Atlanta Falcons and they they you know lost to New England who came back to win it all I go no that was the greatest fourth quarter the game up until that point was boring mm. last night was the same thing it was a boring game until the fourth quarter and then it got interesting in the last few minutes okay so I tuned in at the right time you really did I mean up until that point you didn't miss much it was a defensive game and I mean kudos yeah. to defense on both teams to hold the score as low as they did mm-hmm. but it, it's not exciting football it really isn't yeah because yeah when I first I just like tuned in on the scoreboard and I thought it was three zero and then as soon as I tuned in it was like like it just switched to oh okay somebody just scored a touchdown thanks zero mm-hmm. oh ten zero okay <laughs> So, oh, and I'm thinking, okay, it, it's it's not. And again, I know no one from it. The only reason I know of the word Mahomes is because Mahomes. last year, Mahomes, Mahomes. sorry, because last year, see, I don't know. I just, and the only reason I know about Kelsey, and I knew about Kelsey Taylor before Swift. Taylor, no, before Taylor, because oh, yeah. last year the two Kelseys played against each other. It was yes, the first time right. brothers played against each other in a, in a Super Bowl. And one of them retired, and you know, the one that Taylor is dating is still playing. So. There you go. But that's about all I know. But I play, I, I talked the sports ball today. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Sports I got ball. to hang with sports the dudes. It was, <laughs> um, I was watching the game and I'm kind of like, oh my God, come on, just somebody score. This is boring. <laughs> it used to uh, be like curling matches back in the day before they had the guard zone. I don't know what that is, but sure. Well, now they have like, you're allowed, if you have rocks that are not in the house, you're not allowed to take them out to try to create some stuff that you can go around and and that protects because before curling used to be, put a rock in the house, somebody tries to take it out, does put a rock in the house, someone takes it out. So basically it was put a rock in the house, hope someone misses the takeout, put one on the other side, score your two and that's your game, two, zero, boom. It's almost tic-tac-toe at that point, right? It it literally was for the longest time and and people, and people loved it. Oh yeah. Because, oh yeah, people loved it. They watched it like crazy, but the guard zone makes it much more interesting. Now you've got like tap backs and come arounds and right. Where it was just like, put one in, try to take it out and hope someone misses somewhere along the way. Now you're speaking sports ball to me. (laughs) Yep. No no curling. There you go. So yeah. Any, anything that gives an opportunity for offense and more interesting shots. I, 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 I'm good with. I did catch. uh, So you know how we don't get to see the, Best commercials, right? Because it's that's true. Sub, sub, simultaneous, uh, si- simultaneous substitution. So what happens is we get the Canadian commercials, and and there were a couple of good ones last night. Actually, uh, truth be told, they they did spend some money. Not seven million dollars for thirty seconds, but they spent some money. But uh, I did happen to catch one this morning, which I can't. We can't show. It's uh, no, we're not for yeah. Dunkin' Donuts, and it's uh, it features J Lo in the studio, Ooh. along with. Matt Damon and Ben Stiller and Tom Brady. <laughs> okay. I have a link to it here. I will uh, I'll copy the link and I'll put it in the chat for anybody who wants to have a look at it. And I'll send it directly to you too, sir. It, it's really funny. I, I'm not going to lie. I really thought it was good. It, it's, it's well done. <laughs> it's really well done. Yeah, we can't show it because are great. They'll shut us down if we show it for copyright uh, infringement, which is weird because it's an ad, but that's how it is. Um, I mean, case in point, when we we ran uh, over Christmas, when we did a couple of um, recorded a week's worth of shows, and we put in the uh, ads for the uh, choral group that you're a yes. part of. Melos, yes. Melos. We got copyright violations for showing the commercial. <laughs> like, that we had permission to show. Yeah. 
It's the way the algorithm works, though, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. No. And, and those are not actually filed by the uh, the copyright holder. You, YouTube <laughs> no. often files them automatically, and then That's you right. show them that you you have the right, which we will do. But which which you know what I can I can appreciate YouTube. They're actually doing the right thing in that instance, right? Yeah. They are trying to protect somebody else's intellectual property, so yep. I can respect that. It's just right. a bit of a pain in the ass. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, speaking, since we're speaking the sports, let's keep on speaking the sports right now. The world aquatics championships are going on. Uh, and this happened before the world aquatics championships, but, uh, everybody, if you haven't heard about it, you've been living under a rock, but, uh, summer Macintosh, uh, finally beat Katie Biledecki mm -hmm. in an 800 meter race. Uh, I think it was the first time in 13 years that Biledecki lost. Yes, a race, <laughs> uh, and uh, beat her by about six seconds. So you have our friend Devin Haru who's going crazy about that. That uh, it was a massive this. defeat. Like that, six seconds in a pool. That's yeah. like an hour. That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, and the World Aquatics Championship started soon after, and Canada has three medals already. Uh, there are two medals in uh, what's called. Um, Oh, they're artistic swimming now, which uh, the older people among us might recognize as synchronized swimming. Um, it happened uh, in the solo category. We have a lady named Jacqueline which is Simonot. Why, which was why you can't call it synchro when it's one person. <laughs> yes. Yes. Solo synchro. What? That, it, but, but you're not synchronized if it's just one person. So she uh, she won uh, the silver, I believe it was, yeah. in the technical routine, and uh, got the gold in uh, the what we would call the free routine back in the day. There's another word named for it now, um, but it, I think it's our first medal since 2011 at the Worlds. Oh, really? Now, uh, yeah, in, in the in the discipline. Now, uh, or or at least in solo, if I'm not uh, sure the others. However, unfortunately. Um, this doesn't do much for the Olympics because the Olympics removed the solo categories a couple of years ago in exchange for the whole, whole team one where there's, you know, they do some pretty incredible stuff. They do lifts where they push people outside the water. They do flips in the air and stuff now and because they're able to have like eight or nine. I'm not sure if it's eight or 12 in the team, I guess, but again, they can do platforms that support people and then they can jump off them. And it's really spectacular now if you haven't watched it in the longest time. And it seems that um, the artistic swimming team and the duet spots for Paris Olympics, uh, Canada has qualified uh, with the results there. So that's a quite interesting uh, element there. And uh, water polo has started. The men uh, did uh, not make the world championship this year. The team did not qualify to participate, but the women have. And... Uh, They've been doing pretty well so far. They finished second in their pool and won their first playoff game. So they'll be playing against Spain in the quarterfinal, which Spain is a pretty good team. Mm. Uh, so Hungary is probably the best one uh, for the women, along with the United States. But uh, they'll be playing against Spain, and uh, if they can defeat them, then they'll be going off to the semifinals, and they will be top four in the world. But they're one of the top eight teams in the world right now. Oh, wow. Which is uh, very good for our Canadian women here in water polo. And then in golf, we had uh, Nick Taylor yeah, once again. Time. Won a title. Yeah, he won a title. So Nick Taylor is the guy that won the Canadian Open last year on Canadian soil, breaking a long drought there too. And uh, yesterday it was at uh, the Phoenix Open, we'll call it. I believe it's called like the Waste Management <laughs> Phoenix Open or something. We'll just call it the Phoenix Open. Uh, but yes, he finished tied with another uh, player, Andrew Novak. And uh, But along the way, he scored a record, uh, a course-breaking 60 in the first round on a par 72, I think it was, course. So um, that's, 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 that's a really, really good round. <laughs> uh, and then had two rounds that weren't as great and then closed off with a 65, which got him uh, tied. And uh, in the playoffs, it went to a, a couple of holes, but uh, he managed to uh, outdo his opponent to win the championship. So I think that's his fourth or fifth title uh, ever, I think, and his second one in two years which is uh, good for him. He's uh, And he's only ranked about like 55th, 55th on the money oh, yeah. table. Yeah. So uh, 
I would have thought he was higher, just considering, you know. The, oh. But I guess the, the the two wins that he's had have been re- high profile events. Well, that I, I would guess. Which you know, thrust you into the spotlight or something yes. like that. Or maybe it's just because, you know, he's Canadian and we're hearing about it. That could be. As well. That could be the case. Yeah. Yes. So, but yeah, he's uh, doing very, very well for himself. So, congratulations to Nick Taylor. And uh, then over the course of the weekend, uh, there were lots of medals for Canadians in uh, various sports ski cross and uh, aerials, got something, and short track speed skating. There was some more. And I think Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Kingsbury won another world title, something, and set the all time record for skiing world titles. He just broke it uh, recently. Yes, the t- the record was at 83 at some point, and he got 84, I think, mm-hmm. last weekend or the weekend before, and I think he's like won a fourth event in a row. Yeah, he, the, guy's a, the guy's a freak of nature, and I mean that in the best possible way, because his, uh, like his win-loss percentage is, there's nobody on earth in any sport that even comes close I think his win loss percentage is something like sixty five percent of the time he competes, he wins. Something like that. It's, nobody's it, even close to that in any respective sport. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was last week a uh, record breaking eighty seventh win. Eighty seventh win. Yeah. Yes. And he's not done yet. Nope. And you remember Alex Bilodeau, who when he won his gold medal in in uh, Vancouver in twenty ten. Um, Mikhail Kingsbury was on his way up at that point. And then it was four years later when he repeated his gold medal win and he pointed and he said, this guy right here, this is the guy who's going to be winning everything for, from here on out. Like he is the guy and he wasn't wrong about that. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so yeah, I'm waiting for the Canadian Olympic committee to do the roundup of the events, uh, this weekend so i could uh, actually break it down who won what and then mm. you know what order and that type of stuff because sifting through all the articles on the fly is a little uh, it's not that easy yeah, no, it's, yeah it's not easy and it's tedious for the listeners but uh essentially it was a metal hall weekend for team canada pretty much across the board and even in other sports we had some great results there was the um in canmore alberta there was a big uh, cross-country skiing event which is you know, the place in Canada for it now, especially with the Olympic installations. And uh, there were some wonderful results uh, from Team Canada there. No, no medals, um, but some breakout performances, you know, because like we mentioned before in cross-country skiing, there's often 106, 110 entrants. Mm-hmm. So just being in the top half is great. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, and uh, these are supreme athletes too. Their cardio is off the charts. Right, exactly. And so when you get, um, like in downhill skiing, when you finish top 30, mm-hmm. you get points. Yes, that's right. Ranking points. And uh, so top 30, I mean, if you're not going to win, top 30 is the goal. And uh, we had some Canadians do that uh, here on home soil, which was nice. Men and women uh, score some top 30s. And uh, even in a biathlon, which was... Uh, uh, not held here, mm-hmm. uh, but we had someone uh, score a top 20, uh, which is, again... Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's, for us, that that's uh, pretty interesting. So we, we're having some athletes now that are in sports that are not uh, traditional uh, strong points it. for us, that yeah. are making some inroads, maybe not in medal contention yet in time for 2026, but Takes maybe time. on a surprise day. Mm-hmm. You never know, right? Any A lot of these sports are any given Sunday type events. Well... Surprise day, taking case uh, Penny Alexiak. She wasn't expected to finish in the top 10 in the Olympics the first time she went out at 16 and won, what, two golds, a silver and a bronze or something ridiculous like that? Yeah. So, yeah. You never know what will come up. Or the Billie Jean King Cup just last yeah. summer, uh, last winter, we had uh, uh, Marina Stekusic, mm-hmm. ranked 230-something in the world, and she just went on a tear where she was beating top 100 players left, right, and center. Which yeah, led so, to, so you never know when someone's going to go hot. Well, you, you could have, you know, it's just on any given day, you could just peak and that's it. I have something interesting here I want to share with uh, you and the kids that I don't know if you have seen. And I, I've got some issues with this individual. 
and I'll explain why in a moment after I show you this screen. This is from Holly Doan um, writing an article about the president of the CBC. Okay. The singer S Holly Doan? No, no, no. Holly Doan okay. from Black Locks, I think. is. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I know. I, I see the name and I always think the singer too right away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this is reporter Holly Doan. President of the CBC ran up $119,300 in expenses, same time the network complained of immense pressure on finances. Access to information records show charges include business uh, class junkets to Prague and Hollywood. Now, here's where I have a problem. I, I, that seems like an awful lot. I don't know. Uh, it, it seems like an excessive amount ex of expenses because that's more than I earned last year by a large margin. Number mm -hmm. one. Number two, it was. You know, when they released, what was it, 600 people or 400 people, I can't remember recently, were lost their jobs because of cutbacks because, you know, we just, we're, we have financial pressure. And then she was being interviewed by, oh, was it Rosie Barton? I can't remember. I believe so. Who asked, well, will you be giving out um, executive uh, pay bonuses at the end of the year? Well, that's, you know, that's something we need to discuss. That's a line item on the, excuse me? Excuse me? You're saying you're having financial difficulties, so you're firing people, but you're still getting your bonuses? No. Not cool. That's not how you do it, especially when you consider you're on the public purse. No. Why are they getting bonuses to begin with? I have a major issue with that, and you know I love the CBC, but mm -hmm. that is messed up. Now... As the president, she's going to travel. She's going to do you know things to to try and bring in business and negotiate yeah. deals. I get it. One hundred nineteen thousand is a lot of money, and I not over the course of a year though. For the president of a major corp, yeah, it's it's a lot, but but you know I'll give it a little bit of slack. But it was the whole line item thing about bonuses when you're letting people go. People have lost their livelihood, and you're still going to get a bonus. Yeah. No. No, if you have to fire people, you cut the bonuses so that you can keep people's jobs, period. Well, people rely on those bonuses. People rely on their jobs. So, yeah, I got an issue. Major yep. issue. Yep. Uh, yep. That's legit. That's right. legit. And we have the same thing going on with Bell as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're getting bigger dividend checks for shareholders and all the executives will get bonuses, but they just fired 4,800 people. That shouldn't be happening either. No, it's greed, plain and simple. I'm just, <sighs> like, I know like long arm of the government and all that kind of stuff and you can't, but you would think that there would be like some basic rules. Well, I mean, the optics on like that, that alone are stupid, right? When you consider you've got the CPC, like this CPC president's testimony is going to be broken into sound bites on CPC election ads to scrap the CBC. This is when the president of the CBC should be paying attention to actually what is happening in this country right now with people calling for uh, uh, defunding your organization. Maybe, maybe not fire people, maybe not spend money on bonuses, maybe Maybe take a pay cut. You're going to tell me you can't afford it? You paid more in taxes last year than I earned. Mm. Take the hit. It's called optics. And greed is never a good optic. Yeah. And it's one year. Seriously, one year. You could take a hit one year. It's, uh, I'm mad. I am. I'm really mad about this. And I'm right with you there. I'm right with you. And like I said, I just don't understand why that's that's not a standard. If you're, you know, have to do massive layoffs, there is no stock option bonus. There is no increased yeah. shareholders. No, nope. just no, no. There is no bonus that year. Yeah, she's no. entitled to her entitlements. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they always keep on saying, right? Like this, we have to maintain some competitiveness with the private sector, or else we won't get the best. Just anyway, like I said, that that that's a rule. I would that's a rule change. I would definitely be in favor of. Why are they getting bonuses? I, you're you're on the public dime. Yep. 
shouldn't be getting bonuses. Yep. Sorry if you don't like it. Too bad. I disagree with it. Look, Bell I have an issue with, but they're a private corp. Now, they did take government money. Yep. So, pretty greasy what they did. Oh. But they're a private corporation. CBC is public. So, it's not, it's not cool. Yeah. There's... Um... Interesting that you mentioned that um, because the minister in charge of the CBC, Pascal Saint Ange, mm -hmm. uh, got into it with PP. Uh, with PP the other day uh, on Twitter because uh, Pierre Poliev is representing that $40 million, right? Mm -hmm. That we were talking about as being uh, money that the liberals gave CBC. So you had uh, Pierre no, no, Poliev. Uh, Bell, Bell, Bell. Uh, so Bell, sorry. Yes. So you have Pierre Poliev putting out this tweet here that I'll put up for you to, to show Mr. Grizzly. Just a second. He uh, clips uh, the screen cap of the article that says, Trudeau pissed off by Bell Media's garbage decisions to lay off journalists because the prime minister came out and uh, made a powerful moment uh, mm -hmm. but, uh and hopefully i will find that too because to watch doug ford behind him is priceless mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, this but uh yeah the, the prime minister said it's a garbage decision and then you have uh, pierre Podiev that tweets mr Wesley. if you're so pissed off at bell for the layoffs why don't you demand bell give back the government handout you gave them to save media jobs all right and then pascal saint ange responded with uh, fact check, it was your party who brought the amendment to eliminate $40 million in fees to for Bell at committee. Liberals voted against it. This one is on you. As you can see, your policies are bad for workers and for journalism. So oh. I'm a little, I, don't, I don't fully follow what transpired in that interaction. Okay. So basically... I need you to explain it to me, really. Seriously. I, I okay. just, I'm not following. The decision to eliminate $40 million in fees was a decision that was made in committee. So when you have a bill, mm -hmm. right? Or when you're looking at, uh, how would I put it? Every department ministry has some type of committee. Right. And usually most committees have majority government um, membership, but we have a minority parliament. Mm -hmm. So there are certain committees in which liberals will have a majority, and there's some, some of them on which they have a minority. This is one where they have a minority, it would seem. So at committee, for example, when a bill passes second reading, it goes back to committee almost for a clause-by-clause -clause reading where there will be amendments presented, and that it will come back as a third reading bill that people will vote on, and that's the one that then goes to the Senate for royal assent if it passes. But in committee, they'll also discover, they'll discuss rules and regulations, regulatory changes and stuff like that that don't necessarily have to be voted on but still need to be published. So it seems that in committee, there was an amendment somewhere brought along and it was proposed by the conservatives to eliminate those $40 million in fees. So that $40 million that everybody's saying that Bell got from the government mm -hmm. and then wasted it seems it wasn't even a liberal idea to begin with. Okay, so it was it a was conservative. An, it was a conservative idea. They brought it to committee. Liberals okay. voted against it, and clearly it passed. See, that's where I, that's, I misunderstood it. I understood it as the other way around. That's why I yeah. was like, huh? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't quite follow. Committee votes are different than, like, you'd, you'd have to go back and watch the committee proceeding because for what's on the House of Commons, you have a Hansard, mm -hmm. but not. But I'm not sure. I'm like we're trying to figure out on committee how do you find out where, where committee votes are recorded and you can look up at them. Because again, somebody had to have voted with the conservatives on that. Now, I can see the block doing it because when there's money for CBC, there's money for Radio Canada. Mm -hmm. Right? But I can also see the new Democrats 
having done that. Oh, yes. Right? And um, the New Democrats got in on the action a little bit, too, if I remember correctly. Um, hmm. Trying to see if I have it handy here. No, I do not. All right. So, but basically, Jagmeet Singh was also making the same accusation of the government. You know, you give those $40 million, and it's like, uh, well, uh, Mr. Singh, if yours is the party that voted along with the conservatives on that conservative amendment to cut, <laughs> then you would have both of them again. It's almost like the, um, the democratic reform thing. Right. When they couldn't agree, right. but they could agree to like leave the flaming bag of dog poop on the prime minister's doorstep. Yes, of course. Yeah. And hope that he fault. would stamp it out, make it in his fault. So it would seem that at least two parties, one of which could be the new Democrats because I have no way to go look at the vote. So proposed by the conservatives, supported by at least one other party, according to Pascal saint holmes the liberals voted against it. And now that the thing has blown up in their faces, they're claiming that the liberals actually delivered it because the liberals are the government under which it happened, even though it wasn't their idea and they personally voted against it. Yeah. <sighs> the tangled web we weave. Indeed. But literally... They will say absolutely anything. Anything. Of course, they just want to win the nanosecond. Well, because again, they don't think we'll check. Yeah. Well, they, they and don't. of course, it's much and it's much harder to check for committee than it is. And, you know, you can go to Hansard pretty quickly if you need to. But seriously, mm -hmm. do you know anybody in your life that takes time to say, "Hey, I need to go and check Hansard for that." We typically don't do that, right, as citizens, to go and find out. So, yeah, um, there's some shady, shady stuff going on. Oh, yeah. So I have the uh, video clip. Made. I have the video clip of the PM. Oh, please, yes. Uh, let me just, where did I go here? I have it here somewhere. Uh, no. Oh, there it is. Okay, so hang on a sec. I just had to pull it up. Yeah, so this is the video clip of the Prime Minister uh, with Doug Ford to, uh, voicing his angry um, feelings about what Bell Canada just did. So here, let's watch this little clip. It's about two minutes plus, and Doug Ford looking like the skipper in the background. <laughs> this is a garbage decision by a corporation that should know better. We've seen over the past years, journalistic outlets, radio stations, small community newspapers, bought up by corporate entities, who then lay off journalists, you know, change the offering, the quality of offering to people, and then when people don't watch as much or engage as much, the corporate entity says, oh, see, they're not profitable anymore, we're gonna sell them off. This is the erosion, not just of journalism, of quality local journalism, at a time where people need it more than ever, given misinformation and disinformation, but it's eroding our very democracy. Our abilities to tell stories to each other of how people's lives are, stories that reflect our own communities and not you know, central offices in our biggest cities, is part of what binds this country together from coast to coast to coast with, with incredible diversity of experiences, of geographies. We need those local voices. And over the past years, corporate Canada, and there are many culprits on this, have abdicated their responsibility toward the communities that they have always made very good profits off of in various ways and 
they need, like, as a government, we have been stepping up over the past years, fighting for local journalism, fighting for investments that we can have, while, all the while fending off attacks from conservatives and others who say, no, 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 you're trying to buy off journalists. We're trying to support journalism in this country and across this country. But no government can do it alone. Canadians need to demand better, as we will be demanding better, from corporate leaders, like in this case, Bell, that are eroding Canadians' ability to know each other, to trust each other, and to trust in the country and the future we are building together. So yeah, I'm pretty pissed off about what's just happened. I believe we call that um, shots fired. <laughs> yes, and if it's true that the Liberals did actually vote down that $40 million in committee, then I can see why you'd be pissed off about it specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Doug Ford in the back, clearly not happy. Saw someone he posts something, say, caption this, and it's like, ah, crap, he's going to make a better moment of this than I am. There's nothing <laughs> that I'm going to say after this that's going to make the news. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's the Jagmeet Singh tweet i was talking about oh yeah you got it yep right up there Tudor gave will. bell 40 million no strings attached no guarantees of jobs or local news bell gave it to shareholders and ceos they cut 4800 jobs a garbage decision for sure from a prime minister who feeds a bottomless pit of corporate greed um now if it is true indeed that the liberals voted against that 40 million dollar amendment in committee and that it was proposed by the conservatives and it passed mm -hmm. and let's say it passed with the help of the NDP. This is a particularly duplicitous tweet as well, isn't it? Yeah. From Mr. Singh. He just keeps disappointing me daily. Now, if it passed with the help of the block and not with the help of the, the NDP, NDP, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. Shouldn't Mr. Singh saying, well, no, no, we had people on that committee. Mm -hmm. Minister St. Jean, St. Jean just telling the truth. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it's duplicitous for certain. Yes, but he's represented it as Trudeau gave Bell forty million dollars, and it was an amendment they voted against. But other parties got together and passed because it's a minority minority government, and that can happen. So there's a lot of people here who know what the truth is, and they're fucking with us. Trying us to make us believe that this was a government decision that, again, Trudeau wanted to give them $40 million because allegedly, right, he's buying off the media yeah, yeah. to be his personal propaganda wing. When he actually, they voted against it. They voted against it. And here's the thing that I'm also not getting about the conservatives. If the conservatives believe that the mainstream media or the mainstream media mm. is Trudeau's personal propaganda wing, shouldn't they be overjoyed, elated and happy that there are 4,800 people fewer? Well, you would think, right? But no, they're for the worker, for the common people. And if they were literally his propaganda wing, why would they be weakening their ability to do his propaganda for him by cutting 4,800? You never go to a conservative for consistency. No. You don't. You don't. So, yeah. Uh, our leaders are a little disappointing. And again, it's it, it, we're getting to a situation again where we keep on telling you, right? Don't compare your alternatives to the Almighty. Compare them to each other. Yeah. Don't vote for assholes and don't vote for people who insult your intelligence. I mean, our biggest problem with democracy at, at, at now is that even though all parties stretch things and spin, there's a difference between spin and outright lying. And we have the main alternative on the left just lying and misrepresenting stuff. This is the third time now in two or three weeks that we catch him. And we got the guy on the right his stock and trade is lies, which leaves us with just one party. Unless people are going to mass abandon the NDPs for green and mass abandon the conservatives for the bloc or the PPC. 
Which, the PPC is not, not not much better at telling the truth. No. So, but if we're talking about parties that tell us the truth more often than not, mm-hmm. we're left with greens, yeah, and we're left with liberals. Yeah, and if we're talking about government in waiting or opposition in waiting, it leaves us just with the liberals, which makes us a one-party state. Well, you consider that the Conservative Party of Canada is the Reform Party. The Progressive Conservative Party doesn't exist anymore. And we've seen the erosion of the New Democratic Party from what it once was to what it currently is. And I'm like, what? I I, I know people who hate the Prime Minister. And they can't put a finger on why they just do. And I think it's because they've been told to by media. Maybe I'm wrong. I've asked uh, friends of mine, how exactly have his policies personally harmed you or anyone you know or love? And I'm greeted with silence because they can't cite one. I know that there are people who can. I've yet to meet one. Personally meet one. Face to face. Tell me. Now, all of that being said, I also know those same folks do not like their alternatives in the next federal election, whenever that may be, which should be October 2025, according to the mandated fixed election dates as per the Stephen Harper government in 2007. Yes. Another thing that conservatives are trying to violate again. It's like, I want an election now. This ain't Burger King. You don't get an election just because you want one. The timelines were mandated by your former guy in 2007. Yeah. Yes, and you didn't respect it in 2011. No. You called a snap election because you thought the time was right to get a majority, the exact reason for which you passed that law to try to prevent. So I was like, oh, who wants an, he says nobody wants an election now, doesn't care, doesn't matter if people want an election now or not. We have a law. Mm-hmm. The election is going to happen when the election is supposed to happen. Period. That's why the law has been written. That's what it's there for. <laughs> Jeez. And if it doesn't, it'll be because the opposition parties did something to make it such. It's the only reason. All right. Speaking of Mr. Grizzly, mm-hmm. another tweet up there from uh, Pepe Von Snipes. The Toronto Star is desperate to protect Trudeau. Instead of listening to mayors struggling with crime, they're trying to downplay the insanity of 40 individuals having 6,000 arrests or criminal incidents. This is the crime and chaos on our streets after eight years of Trudeau. Okay. okay, so once again, they're trying to protect, right? Media is all in the bag for Trudeau, protecting, covering up. Well, you want to know what had PP in a snit? This, Mr. Grizzly. Let's, <clears throat> let's have a look at this. Oh, yes. This, yeah. Pierre Polyev claims 40 offenders were arrested 6,000 times in Vancouver in a year. Is that actually true? Somebody decided to fact check him. Mm. Well, let's see. The conservative leader often pushes his tough on crime approach by relying on an eye opening statistic. The star investigates to see if it's true by Raisa Patel. Ooh. A woman. Yeah. yeah. With a name that sounds from somewhere else. Oh, my goodness. That must have really pleased him. Yeah. Because he, you know, he likes to speak in Anglo-Saxon terms. <laughs> that's not. That's not even a dog whistle. That one. Oh man. That's oh, not man. even a dog whistle. That. That's just straight up saying he's a racist piece of white supremacist garbage. Yep. Let's find out if it's true, kids and cups. In the lead up to the next federal election, the star is looking at is taking a look at the leaders of Canada's major federal parties and fact-checking some of their most common political slogans and talking points. Today, the star is analyzing a claim that conservative leader Pierre Polyev has made multiple times over the past year, that 40 offenders in Vancouver were arrested 6,000 times over the course of a single year. Many times, but not always, Pierre Polyev says the offenders were violent or links the statistics to the issue of repeat offenders committing violent crimes while released on bail. It's a number he's thrown out at rallies, in the House of Commons, at news conferences, and on radio programs as part of an effort to paint the Liberal government as soft on crime. 
This week, when asked by journalists whether Polyev's oft-used slogan, jail, not bail, meant he believed Canadians should no longer have the right to be presumed innocent, the conservative leader said the phrase would only apply to people who had been convicted dozens of times prior to their most recent arrest. Let me give you proof. In Vancouver, they had to arrest the same 40 offenders 6,000 times in one year, Polyev said. On average, an offender would have been arrested 150 times a year. Many of them would have had 100 arrests, and they're newly arrested for a series of violent offense and literally released within hours. The rearrests of those 40 violent offenders are a direct result of the Prime Minister's easy bail system, Polyev said during question period last March. So, are the numbers real, and is this all Trudeau's fault? Here's what you need to know. And, uh... Hold on to your hats, kids. <laughs> no. Were 40 violent offenders arrested in Vancouver 6,000 times in one year? No. The numbers are legitimate, but they apply to something else. The figures first appeared in a letter from the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus to the BC government in 2022. On Friday, when Polyev raised the statistic again during a news conference in Surrey, he erroneously said the data came from BC Union of Mayors. You know what? If we're applying the U.S. GOP standard, because recently Joe Biden was talking about uh, Egypt, the, the, something that they were doing to their borders with regard to Israel and Gaza. And while he was talking about it, he said Mexico while talking about Sisi, mm -hmm. his leader of Egypt. And everybody said, oh my God, he doesn't even know what country he's talking to. He's losing his mind. We need to get rid of him now. Blah, blah, blah. He got everything else right like this, but he just happened to be talking to two leaders of two nations with which there are border issues in the same week and said Mexico instead of Egypt, but got the name of the leader right and everything else right. Slip of the tongue happens to all of us. Well, uh, if Pierre said that he was with the BC Union of Mayors and not the BC Urban Mayors Caucus, well then, is he in cognitive decline? He must be, yeah, clearly, yeah. Just asking questions. Or maybe he had too much of that Christmas eggnog. Anyway. Hey, dude likes to day drink. At the time, BC's then Attorney General David Eby, who was now Premier, had requested data from the BC UMC about repeat offenders and their criminal activity. The second page of the letter, which Polyev's office confirmed to the star it had consulted, includes a table that lists the number of prolific or chronic offenders in 10 of BC's most urban cities and the number of, quote, negative police contacts the offenders had in those cities. To start, the numbers in the table only refer to repeat property offenders not violent ones. Oops. There's a gross mix characterization. So apparently, you know, getting your window smashed is now a violent crime. I'm just, I'm just saying. That's a property exactly. offender, yes. A property offender is somebody who commits a crime like mischief or theft or vandalism, someone who causes damage or takes another person's property, said Kyla Lee, a Vancouver-based criminal defense lawyer. A violent offender is somebody who commits an assault or murder or uses a weapon or threatens somebody. Okay, so Vancouver had 40 property offenders, not violent offenders. Mm -hmm. Why were they arrested 6,000 times? Why were they arrested 6,000 times? Okay. Also, no. The table explicitly notes that those offenders were linked to 6,385, quote, negative police contacts, which the Vancouver Police Department confirmed to the star cannot be interpreted to mean arrests. Negative contact is defined in the table as someone being considered a suspect, a suspect who is chargeable, an individual who has been charged, or a person for whom charges have been recommended. The notion that 40 individuals could be arrested that many times in one year is, quote, impossible said Michael Spratt, a criminal defense lawyer in Ottawa who said he has consulted Crown attorneys, police officers, and other lawyers about Polyev's framing of the statistic. As for whether that number of negative police contacts took place over the course of a single year, that claim is harder to verify because of how the Vancouver police classifies the city's most chronic offenders. The table's footnote references the department's definition of, quote, super chronic offenders, which is anyone who has had five break and enter convictions in the last 10 years years mm. and 10 negative police contacts within the last year which at that time was 2021 according to a senior former municipal government source in vancouver who spoke to the star on the condition they not to be named the data in question came directly from the vpd 
but because the letter does not specify during which time frame the incidents occurred, the VPD would not confirm whether the 6,385 figure came entirely from them and whether it could be traced to a single year. So they're not violent offenders, they're not 6,000 arrests, and we don't even know if they happened all in one year. So that's three big lies in that statement right now. Big shock to me. Not. Some people, yes. Some people like conservative MP Ted Falk link the statistic to 2022, but that is untrue because the mayor's letter is only dated April 5th of that year. You cannot have data for full 2022 in April. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are the liberals, t- unless he's got some type of crystal ball and Madame M- Miss Cleo in his, uh, part of his uh, campaign team, Are the liberals to blame for repeat offending? Polyev frequently ties the issue of repeat offenders to two laws introduced by the Trudeau liberals. In 2019, the government passed what was then known as Bill C-75, a sweeping piece of legislation that was partly aimed at making it easier to obtain bail. Also in Polyev's sights is the recently passed Bill C-48, which made it harder for repeat violent offenders to be released on bail, which made it harder Mm -hmm. for repeat violent offenders to be released on bail, but he's saying it's making it easier. Okay, just he's saying that the bill does the opposite of what the bill actually does. And in our parliament, when we, especially in the minority parliament, we have everybody looking at that and going to committee and making sure that the bill does what it says that it does. And you can't include clauses and amendments in a bill that change the purpose of the bill. And then when it goes to the Senate, you have the sober chamber of sober second thought. They actually make sure that the bill mm-hmm. does what the bill says it does. Like that's part of their job. Conservatives are saying that after all of that, the bill does the opposite, makes it easier for violent defenders to be released when the bill's stated purpose is to make it harder. Okay, so another lie. Premiers and police chiefs pushed for those changes. Let me repeat that again. Premiers and police chiefs pushed for those changes after a spate of violent offenses were linked in some cases to people out on bail. First, it's important. And, and uh, that, that, that's a, an important fact that seems to be ignored. And, and, and another fact that, that, that sailed over everybody's heads here is the fact that policing is a municipal and provincial issue, not a federal issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is why the premiers were asking for it. Uh, First, it's important to note that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees that anyone charged with an offense has the right not to be denied reasonable bail without just cause. Second, And here's where things get a little spicy. Indigenous people, black and racialized Canadians, and people with mental illnesses are overrepresented in Canada's criminal justice system, many of whom face barriers in obtaining bail because of systemic discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's this point experts say that Polyev is missing when he pastes the issue squarely on the federal liberals. Quote, the type of offenses that marginalized people perhaps are more likely to commit, we choose to deal with through criminalization rather than through treatment, prevention, or harm reduction said Spratt. It's unlikely that any law that this government passed can fully explain or can be responsible, he added. Lee said it, said the real problem is that provinces aren't looking at the right social supports to deal with root causes of crime. Quote, provincial governments also should be stepping in to fix it by ensuring that they're developing appropriate policies, Lee said. To the extent that government should be doing something, it should be cooperation between federal and provincial level governments but amendments to the criminal code or, God forbid, changing the Constitution and amending the Charter are not a solution to this problem. Well, (laughs) there you go. So he lied blatantly multiple times, keeps repeating the lie, hoping, hoping that'll become the truth someday, maybe, you think? Tell a lie, make it big, and repeat it until it becomes the truth. Wasn't that from Goebbels' playbook? I think so. I think so. And just to go back uh, for the kids who don't uh, remember, because it came early in the story, when we refer to Spratt, Spratt is a criminal defense lawyer in Ottawa who consulted Crown attorneys, police officers, and other lawyers about Polyev's framing of the statistics. So uh, when he says that uh, the offenses that marginalized people are more likely to commit as are being dealt with through criminalization rather than through treatment prevention and harm reduction. Mm-hmm. He knows what he's talking about. Oh, yes. So, right. yeah, it's all very suspicious, to say the least. Yeah, and we talk about Lee 
uh, as well, Kyla Lee, which was a Vancouver-based criminal defense lawyer. So when she is saying again that provincial governments should be stepping in to fix it by ensuring that they're developing appropriate policies, because as we mentioned in the show, when you're just trying to survive, people will do what they will do. If you have an addiction, people will do what they need to do to feed their fix. And those are the property crimes. Mm -hmm. The car is being broken into, shoplifting, petty theft, mm -hmm. those mischief crimes. Because well, people are trying to get by. Look at this from Dan, and, and, and I quote, I was arrested in my teens for stealing from Zellers, barred for life and no bail. Three weeks in jail for $50 worth of product. The most effective people in this issue are those living in poverty overall. So they had you in the clink for three weeks for $50. How much money did that cost us, the taxpayers, for that? Yep. There could have just been restitution, right? Three restitution weeks? Restitution with a small fine. For 50 bucks? <sighs> It's definitely more than $50 a day to keep a person incarcerated. So they did it for 21 days, three weeks. Let's, let's conservatively, conservatively say at the time it was $80 a day to keep you incarcerated. It was more than that. But let, let's just say it was 80 bucks a day. One day costs more than the amount of product that you shoplifted. Yep. And they did it for 21 days. Do the math. That is yeah. not what you call value for money. That is not fair uh, punishment for the crime committed. Not even close. Yep. As Kit Cassie mentions, and we've mentioned it on the show, it costs less to fund community support and activity programs than it does housing someone in jail. As a conservative, even I get that. It always costs less to do the right thing. Give people the basics. Watch the petty crime rate go down. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know what? And, and the, the thing that Cassie says here is something that I have been pushing for years, and I have progressive conservative friends who say, let's just fund this. A buddy of mine recently said, and he's as conservative as the day is long, and, and he hates Trudeau, but he said, we need to build housing now. I, maybe we can build barracks. We're really good at doing that quickly. We could build barracks, make them individual rooms. We could do this fast. We need to do it because there's too many people living on the streets. Getting people off the streets and into housing helps to end crime. Yes. And, and he's, he's, not, he's speaking from, from lived experience because his wife uh, is a social worker. Yeah. She's and speaking, telling him, you know, point blank. Yeah, and speaking of reducing this stuff, there's lots of principles of restorative justice, mm -hmm. which are very, very common within the indigenous, indigenous community that could be taken and that could be made law that would benefit all of us. You want to talk about some reconciliation? Let's take some indigenous law and in the cases where it can apply, make it national law. Well, that would make sense though, right? Good that ideas. Happens. Well, for that type of stuff, yeah, there should be a court of restorative justice. Yes. Well, it's like PNC nobody miles. needs to go to jail for fifty dollars. The cruelty is the point. Bingo. Bingo. There is no for all these people that keep on call, talking about money. We need to balance the budget and whatnot. Right? There's a lot of people in that demographic for whom there is no amount of money that is too little to spend to punish or keep people in a state of dependency. That they have money for. But they don't have money for basic income, though. Yeah. Well, and I just uh, saw a thing the other day where Elon Musk was talking about uh, universal basic income. And he's talked about it a few times. And, I mean, I have my issues with him. I have mm -hmm. a lot of issues with him. But on this one, I see eye to eye. Because guess what? When the robots take the jobs, when the IA, AI takes the jobs, when automation takes the jobs... How are people going to live? How will people buy the products that people manufacture? The products that the robots make, they're not going to buy them. AI isn't going to purchase a product. Software. It's like, 
without a universal basic income, we'll all just starve to death and die. So either we get rid of money altogether or a universal basic income becomes the norm. Because there are jobs that are disappearing daily right now. And, and I've been saying this since we started this show. As we see more and more automation take over, now we have the the big rigs from Tesla, electric trucks that will have a certain amount of automation, which means that long haul, well, as I should say medium haul. So say there's product in Toronto that needs to come to Ottawa. It leaves an Amazon, as an example, an Amazon warehouse in Toronto, drives down the highway because the warehouse is usually located right next to a highway, like the two big ones we have here in Ottawa, the, what do they call them? And distribution centers? Is that what they're called? I think I can't remember mm -hmm. the name, but they're, they're located right next to the highway. So the big rig gets in with the load, which has been loaded by robots. <laughs> okay. And the big rig drives from distribution center to distribution center. Then the so-called last kilometer or last mile, as our American friends like to say, is uh, loaded into smaller trucks where people go out and deliver it. But Jeff Bezos, for the last seven or eight years has been touting AI robot delivery bots along with drones to deliver product. This is something that's in the works. It's in the drawing books. This is planned. So these drivers that currently have these jobs, yeah. 10 years, they won't exist. Fulfillment centers. Thank you, PNC Bio. Yes, thank you. So, yeah. You know, if... Just, once once the jobs are gone, how do we eat? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's a vital question. Yep. Kit Linda, humans freed by UBI will be able to devote themselves to working at things they actually like to do. That's what happened with CERB. Yes, it was. Yep. Yeah. It was indeed. Well, I Absolutely. mean, I, we, we started this during the pandemic. I was back to work. Well, I had started my music shows when they told us all to stay home. So I was home for two months. I was doing a music show every day. And then we started this um, 20, April of 2020, we started this. So it was still full pandemic, but I had been back to work for almost a year at that point once we started because I was only home for two months. But there was a lot of other people and I have a lot of friends who work in uh, theater and they, they were completely shut down, completely. There was like no, no touring acts. Nobody was, you know, people who earn money setting up big concerts and video and productions like that were not making any money. They were home. Now, television and movies kept shooting. They, they shut down for like about a week, I think. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's funny how if you're a filmmaker, the rules don't apply to you. And it was a friend of mine who was a producer, and was a producer. He's, he's retired now filmmaker, director, writer, producer, and said, we didn't shut down at all. We were closed for like four or five days, and then we just found a way to get back up and get producing. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. He goes, yeah, we had a five-day break, and then that was it. Everybody else was sitting at home for two months. Yeah. Indeed. Well, um, and I agree with Saucy about this one. AI and robots will free humanity from some of the mundane jobs that we don't need to be doing. There are good things about it. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Uh, completely. 100%. And, and for jobs that are extremely dangerous for human beings to do, AI and robots can do them. Do them better. And if they get damaged, well, so what? It's not a human being. You know. Yep. Just send in a repair bot and you're good to go. <laughs> right. Moving on to the provinces, there's... A lot of the polling news, and I know people, every time I talk about polling, people, but I'm going to be talking about polling, okay, right? All right? We're all talking about the federal numbers all the yeah, time. Look at, look at the but there's numbers. some interesting stuff going on in the provinces. So I'd like to start with the province of Quebec because um, we've noticed that uh, Francois Legault has been having a tough time lately. I've been talking about it on the show. Uh, but we haven't checked in with a little bit. So it's like, Francois Legault is going through a tough time. How tough is it? <laughs> Mr. Grizzly, if you would. 
Let's just put this right up on. Oops, put that up on the screen there. Francois Legault is going through such a tough time that, based on the most current provincial polling projection projections by Aggregator Three Thirty Eight Canada, this came out at the end, uh, I believe, of the year. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, January thirty first last poll. Uh, the PQ was above the CAC by ten percentage points. Now, look at this line here from the CAC. Ah, free fall. And if that translates into seats, kids and cubs, um, Ooh. the CAC has gone from a very big majority. This is the line that says what a majority is. Mm -hmm. Very big majority government to a fourth place party. Precipitous free fall. Behind the liberals, behind Quebec Solidaire, and only three seats ahead of, I'm guessing this would be the Quebec Conservative Party, which is a relatively new entity. Um, um, <laughs> I have a feeling, I have a feeling that uh, maybe his job security isn't what he hoped it had been. First to fourth. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty big. That's a pretty big drop. Then uh, there are some elections in some provinces this year. Uh, one of them is in British Columbia. The other one is in New Brunswick. And the other one's in Saskatchewan. Um, New Brunswick hasn't had an updated provincial polling since September when it was showing that the Liberals might be great gaining a lead on the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. Come on. Give us something, since September is quite a long way. But uh, if we look at British Columbia for the moment, it seems that uh, Premier David Eby is doing quite well for himself, Mr. Grizzly. Let's bring this up here. There we go. In polling, holding pretty steady and even getting a little slight tip upwards. The BC uh, NDP is uh, standing at about 46%. Looks like they would increase their seat count because, you know, down here all the way up to 81 of the seats, which would, I mean, basically leave all but 12 seats in the legislature if there was an election held today. So things are looking pretty stable there, but the election is until uh, later in the year and a lot can happen. But the real interesting piece of news I have is from Saskatchewan because we've been reporting a lot in Saskatchewan that uh, Premier Mo seems to have the highest, some of the highest approval ratings from uh, citizens. And something really, really interesting is happening in Saskatchewan. I don't know if it might have to do with uh, his ability to either manage electricity or he is uh, wanting to invoke the notwithstanding clause to oppress children. But, um, Mr. Grizzly. Let's see. Is that... There we go. The spread is definitely less popular mm -hmm. than it was on January 1st, 2023. He's going down, too. This, is a, this has been a trend. Oh, sorry. That's January 1st, 2021. So since, since about, I'd say, June or, well, no, March. Mm -hmm. March 2022, it's been a pretty much steady decline. He had a bit of a and bump. And now, pardon? He had a bit of a bump there. A bit of a bump there. But there's a sharp tightening right here starting at mm -hmm. the beginning of 2024. And the Saskatchewan party and the NDP are just one point between each other. The Saskatchewan party is polling at 46 and the NDP at 45, which, if you translate to seats, uh, still has the Saskatchewan party in majority territory with 33 seats, but only by two seats. And the NDP at a high since 2021 at 28 seats. So the NDP in Saskatchewan has never been stronger in the last four years, or in the last, at least, in the last current election cycle. There might be, and that election's in October, unless Scott Moe decides to pull a plug and go a little earlier himself. 
Mm. But it seems that there are some people that are not so happy. They're saying maybe it's time for no mo mo. Well, I'm surprised. I was just going to let this one this long. Yeah, I was just going to let this election pass by, mm-hmm. not give it much attention because it looked like a foregone conclusion. Looking at the premier approval ratings, but um, maybe not. So if you're living in Saskatchewan and if you're progressive. Because in you know the last few elections, you might not have just dis- you've been deciding. Well, there's no point in going to vote, which I'm sure a lot of people have done. Which is how we ended up getting Doug Ford with a majority government with what 13 yeah. percent of the vote. It uh, <sighs> might be time, might be time, to consider getting back in the game. Because mm-hmm. all of a sudden, this election is flippable. Well, and hopefully, it'll flip. Ah, yes. Kit Cassie goes, the decline in Saskatchewan party standings is due to their abysmal health care system. The parents' rights is a distraction. Doesn't seem to be working yet. No, no, and it won't. Yes, and as Kit Linda M. mentions as well, I think we mentioned it on the show, PEI just had a provincial by-election and flipped a longtime conservative seat to green. So, I'm not sure if this pro-conservative push that we're all being told at the federal level is happening and is completely inevitable actually is because we had that by-election in Newfoundland and now this by-election in Prince Edward Island and we're Mm -hmm. seeing the margins getting tight uh, with the Saskatchewan party and the margins were tight in New Brunswick anywhere where there seems to be a uh, at least a conservative provincial government they're having a tough time I mean Alberta was close Oh, yeah. The NDP screwed that election off, but Alberta was close. Manitoba flipped. It's looking like New Brunswick could flip. Now it's looking like Saskatchewan could flip. That would not make me sad. Maybe Canadians are realizing that the premiers are the problem. It's taken time, but as more and more people are learning basic civics on how in Justin Trudeau's Canada, health care is a provincial responsibility. Oh, right, yeah, I forgot about that. In Justin Trudeau's Canada, crime runs rampant because that's a municipal and provincial responsibility. In Justin Trudeau's Canada, yeah, everything you're talking about are municipal and provincial responsibilities. Stop blaming him for things that are not in his mandate or his purview or his responsibility. You can hate him all you want, but do it for the right reason. Don't for hate a reason. for something your premier has done to you. <laughs> like, have a reason. Have a reason. Yeah. It's like if, you, like, I'm just saying, it's like if you're going to be a rebel, be a rebel with a cause. Yeah. Not a rebel, Not without, a rebel a without a clue. <laughs> it's just, great, great minds think alike. Uh-huh. <laughs> And oh, I man. think Hugh's right about this. Uh, no, sorry, uh, my dogs are goth. Whoops, here we go, here we go. Uh, if uh, Nahid Nenshi runs for NDP leader here in Alberta, I bet money he would win. And I, I think I think you are correct. It wouldn't surprise me in the least bit. Uh, he's a beloved mayor. Uh, city of Calgary still love and respects him. Even people who don't particularly care for his politics respect him. And as, as, as um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. David Wallace told us I couldn't Mm. buy him off. He goes, the man is not corrupt. I tried to corrupt him. He had no part of it. I'm like, he's a good man. And he's like, and that's the thing David Wallace said. He says, I, he says, I don't see eye to eye with him politically, but I respect the hell out of him because he would not play dirty politics. He wouldn't play the game. He's a good man. So let's see if he runs. I know everybody seems to think he's going to. Maybe. It would be good for Alberta. At least I certainly think it would be good for Alberta. I'm sure there's a lot of other people that that would agree with that. Whether or not he does is another question. I mean, let's face it. You want to run for that position, you have to crawl back under the microscope again. And not everybody wants to do that. I mean, he was the mayor for 10 years? Oh. Eight years it seems for sure. Like it would be longer. Maybe it was twelve. But I, you know, but well, that's the thing is, like, when you become like ubiquitous, mm-hmm. you just, like, yeah. he was 
you just like think he was so long. No, only 11 years. Yeah. Oct- so literally to the day, October 25th, 2010 to October 25th, 2021. 11 years. See, I would have thought he was, he was mayor like for 15 easily. Because he was, mm-hmm. he was everywhere and he was good at his job. Well, and I still remember him during the, the, the flooding back in was yeah. 2000, 2010, the flooding, if, if memory is. He's like, I can't believe I have to say this. Don't go near the river, <laughs> the bow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't go near the river. I can't believe I have to tell you this. Just don't do it. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Hmm. What else I, have I got here for you today? Oh yes, uh, I put something in uh, the uh, in the, the private chat there for you, Mister Grizzly. Uh, it's Danielle Smith. Yeah, I have it. I have it here. Do we? Want uh, to do it's it? it's an audio clip, and I would like you to hear it because um, I want you to hear the step to the right oh, that she is seven. making in this clip here. Here we go. This is. Um... Well, just listen to this. This is from our friend Nate at The Breakdown. Yep. What kind of supports are going to be put in place to ensure the safety and security of that child if their home life is not safe? What supports are going to be available to those uh, within the education sector knowing that we may have been the reason the student may have killed themselves? Is mandatory outing of the students by education staff safe and truly secure when considering the students and potential home lives? Yeah, that that absolutely will not happen. And that is not the intention of, of what we're proposing. What we're proposing is that if the child is out, they have a new name. They have a new gender. They're presenting that way. They're using the washrooms. They're participating in the sports clubs. Every member of the school community knows it. And presumably their you, family. Then yeah, that's you, that's you, the presumption. Then right? the, the point is you, you cannot have that child then pretend when the parent is on site and go back to their dead name and go back to their other gender and dress differently and have the entire school community trying to keep a secret like that from the parents and the family. That, that I think, is more damaging to a child. What? Okay. So, lots going on here. First of all, the presumption that if a child is out at school where they would feel safe among friends or just exploring, trying stuff out. Yeah. At school friends, that they are necessarily out at home. I can tell you from personal experience that that's not true. Mm Mm-hmm. I was way more out at school and I wasn't particularly out at school, but I was way more out at school than I was at home. And I certainly was way more out at other places. I went to pride parades when I was 16, but I made sure that there was no television cameras anywhere. So Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be caught on the news. Right. I had a circle of friends with whom I was out. I was not out at home. Mm -hmm. So that presumption is wrong in the first place. Now this is not just all transgender kids, right? This is all rainbow kids now. Right. She's talking about that. Yeah. Right. So she's moved over to include all of us now. You knew that was inevitable, though. Yeah. You, you knew, knew that, that was inevitable. Coming. Yeah, that yeah. was coming. Like this. And then it's like, well, no, no. If kids are out, so if you do not want this sort of mandatory reporting or be forced to get permission or all that kind of stuff, then all you have to do is just not be out. Uh-huh. Right. That's the solution. So, Stay in that little closet in the dark where you're alone and afraid and lonely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And just so long as we don't have to see it. Right. What I keep on saying is that a lot of these rules are to ex- reduce the amount of public space in which people can exist. Mm-hmm. Just stay in and yeah. none of us will have a problem. We won't have to see it. We won't have to be offended by you being your authentic self. That's exactly what she's saying. It's exactly what she's saying. And she's saying this will never happen. She can't guarantee that. She can't guarantee a damn thing. She can't guarantee that. And we already know that her starting premise is, right, we assume that all parents love their children, even though Mm -hmm. one in four kids 
who identify as rainbow or trans, no, as rainbow, are told to leave. Mm-hmm. And it's as close to close to about 43% who are trans are told to leave home. There's data on this that all these families are going to be loving. And if something bad happens to that child, well, we have a criminal justice system for that. So we'll deal with that after yeah. something yeah. bad has happened to the child, not before. We will not try at all. We will not invest any energy whatsoever in trying to prevent something bad from happening. We to won't the child. be proactive. We'll be real. We'll just, we'll, we'll just start with the assumption that all kids are going to be okay. And if something happens, then we'll deal with that. How enthusiastically, with how much zeal we'll deal with that, well, that remains to be questioned. Well, here's a, here's, uh, a, here's a question exactly, right? This is just spelling it all out, right? Look at this. So, at Rob Ferguson, am I getting this? If you are gay or trans teen, then there's absolute, absolutely no risk at all, provided you say, stay deep, deep in the closet. And the first response from uh, Boy Chuck H, yes, that's the sentiment among Albertans. Do not be your authentic self to ensure you do not make the other people uncomfortable. What a shit world we live in lately. And this is something that we used to internalize amongst ourselves, actually. Mm-hmm. Don't scare the neighbors. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Th- no, that I'm... was a, a saying within the gay community. It's mm-hmm. like, just tone it down. Don't scare the neighbors. That's why often back in the days of the 80s and the 90s when we were starting to get our rights, every time there was a pride parade and it was a drag queen on the cover of the newspaper, you'd have a whole section of the gay community going, oh, God, why don't they have to show freaking drag queen again? They all think that we're all like that. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. There was a lot of hate within our community to other members within our community. Because those of us who just wanted to pass and be left alone mm-hmm. yeah, that's, had issues with those of us who are a little more flamboyant. A friend, a friend of mine years ago, he came out. He came out to my mom first at work, um, and uh, my mom was very accepting and understanding. She's like, and he was like, "Oh, I wish you were my mother. You're so accepting." And she's like, well, "That's because we're friends and coworkers. I don't know if I would react the same way if it were my son coming out to me." She's and she said point blank, "I don't know how I would react." This is 30 years ago, okay? And that's an honest statement. She doesn't know how she would react. She would still love me, but I'm sure it would be a bit of a a gut punch, right? Mm. Because, you know, it's like now my child is going to be part of an ostracized, marginalized community. Things have changed an awful lot from 30 years ago to today. Mm. But that coworker of hers, um, he finally came out to his family and it was, you know, it was a little rough, but he was fully accepted. And his older brother said, I will, uh, I'll march in the pride parade with you. And he said, Nope, I'm not doing that. I said, why not? He says, I don't want to be Danny, the guy marching in pride again, 30 years ago. He goes, I just want to be Danny. I don't want to be identified with, uh, the drag queen or the, or the, the guy in the leather studded jock strap. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think I can understand that because people automatically paint you with that same brush. You're part of the community, but you're, you're, you don't represent the entire community and the entire community doesn't represent you. It's just like, I will say from time to time, fucking white people fully realizing I'm a white people. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not every white people. It's like the, not all men. Yeah, I know. Not all men. Men can be pretty horrible, especially white men. Not all of us. But I don't have to say not all of us because I know when somebody says something derogatory towards white males, it's not directed at me. Because I'm able to discern and critically analyze and discover that, oh, wait, I don't fall into that category, so I'm not even going to worry about it. Yep. So, yeah. Um, <sighs> this is really And she stuff. says it. She says it in such a way that makes it, if you're not educated, I think there's a kit that uh, made that comment here, something like this, that, that those are not educated or informed about it. That, like, this sounds normal. Mm-hmm. If you didn't know anybody, you said, well, yeah, I can get with that. But no. It's like, if you are out at school, you're not necessarily out at home. And she can't guarantee that no child will not be outed. She just can't. Like, and she's literally telling people, well, if you're out, then it's not a problem, right? Yeah. I mean, you'll be able to be out at school. You'll get your parents' permission and everything like this. But yeah, but 
What if you're not? What if you're out at school because that's your couple of hours a day where you can actually be yourself and then you have to code switch when you go back. And then the ultimate thing at the end, right? What's more damaging? She presents it as being more damaging to the kid. Mm -hmm. Staying in the closet or forcing all of your friends and the entire school to keep your secret for you. And again, lie to your family. She is literally telling these children, shame on you. Mm -hmm. You are a horrible and selfish person for burdening us with your secret and forcing it to forcing us to keep it when really what's going on is that someone is trusting you enough to share some very intimate information about them and trusting that you recognize that it's not your information to either share or keep secret from anyone. It's not your information to do anything with it. You cannot be keeping a secret if it's not yours. You're aware of information that is someone else's to tell. That's all there's going on. They're not asking you to keep a secret. Mm -hmm. They're not asking you to share it with anyone, and they're not asking you to hide it from anyone. They're just asking you to accept them and mind your own business. Well, it's kind of what they're kind of saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it's like, no, it's okay. You can be exactly who you are, just as long as you do it behind closed doors in a closet in the dark when nobody can see and make me uncomfortable. Then you can be your real authentic self. Isn't that what they're saying? Yeah. And if you want to be your authentic self here, but are not ready to be at home, then shame on you for making me an accomplice mm -hmm. in maintaining your lie. Yeah. And all your friends. What kind of friend are you to get all your friends to keep a secret and lie to your parents? And, and we're talking about, uh, what are we talking about here again? Which, which member of the community? What, what, what's their age demographic? Yeah, the children. 10 to 14, 15. Children, teenagers. <sighs> I am not impressed with this woman. I hate her more every day. And I want to know, you know, when did she switch? When did she be, go from the libertarian, um, everybody live and let live, to suddenly being the puppet of David Parker? When did that happen? Why and how? Because she's a libertarian by nature. She used to stand up for kids. Now she wants to throw them under the bus. So when did that change? What was it? Does David Parker have some compromise on her? Gotta wonder. I see this quip here from uh, Kit, my dogs are goth. My Mormon parents shipped me to another Mormon house in Idaho for a year for reprogramming. I came back worse. Yeah, I had posted that on the screen there earlier. I have Kit Michael here going, I have always said, you're human. I love you for who you are. Why can't this fucked up world realize there's no difference? Mm -hmm. It's always easier to do the right thing. It's always easier to do the kind thing. Well, and not only that, you, you to do the right and kind thing takes a heck of a lot less energy. <laughs> well, yes. Physical and emotional. Yes. It's just easier. It's like, Mr. Grizzly, I'm gay. Okay. Hey, great. Okay, or some students say, okay, well, shh, don't let the audience know. We got to keep it a secret. No, don't so much energy. Yeah. So much energy would go into that. Yeah, way too much energy. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay. You can say that to me, but like when my friends are around, you know, you better put that yeah. shit away. So much energy. I just, uh, do you think that, it. do you think that might be why when you look at the face of, um, Pierre Polyev, and then contrast it with the face of the prime minister. The prime minister who is seven years or eight years older yeah. than Pierre Polyev, seven yeah. or eight, I'm not sure. He's just turned 51 on Christmas yeah. Eve. I believe so, yeah. Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Christmas uh, Day. It's Christmas Day, yeah. He turned 51 on Christmas Day. He does not look like a 51-year-old man. Why? And, and this is a man who has a job that is very high pressure and very stressful. And it tends to age people. But if you're 
a, a happy, loving individual, it shows on your face. And if you put a side-by-side -side shot of them up there, which person is uh, loving, accepting, kind, and gracious, gracious, and which person is looking angry and filled with rage and hate? Contorted and... Mm-hmm. Yep. You have you have a shot there for me, do you? The Prime Minister is fifty two, and Pierre Polyev is forty four. So six, seven, eight years. Yeah, six, yeah about eight eight years. Yeah. yeah, they're about they're about Pierre Polyev's uh, birthday's in June, and the Prime Minister's is in December, so yeah. like about seven and a half. Those two. <laughs> PNC bio. <laughs> yes, I was I was thinking that when we said Christmas Day, that must be another reason conservatives hate him. Yeah, yeah. Stealing thunder from the baby Jesus on his big day. <laughs> rage hatred ignorance all reasons are good when it's raging right <laughs> Does, i don't care how you get there so long as you get to rage woo polyev looks a lot older and i and i know i've said this time and time again i question his health right now and and i'm, I'm looking at him going like well it's i'm it could very well be the case uh, he, he looks, I would bet on doesn't that. look healthy. He doesn't. Well, there's, there's a couple of mornings he shows up to some press conferences and he looked like he was sleeping on the clothesline. I don't know if he has a, a substance abuse program, a, a problem. If he does, I, I, I feel sorry for him, believe it or not, because I do too. it's but human it not suffering. Happen. Yeah. It's I, human I suffering. It. Parliament Hill runs on alcohol and amphetamines. It does. Speed, it cocaine, does. meth, booze. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it true. runs on that stuff. There's, there's only you don't get through that pace of work. No, no, and they do work just on energy hours. alone. Yeah, yeah, they work insane hours. They do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, not saying all of them, but there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. <clears throat> All right. Happier news. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame time, people. Oh. Yes, yes. The nominations came out. There are 15 artists who are in contention to join the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, Ten of them are first time on the ballot. Other five are returnees. And we have Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, Cher, Dave Matthews Band, Eric B. and Rakim, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, Jane's Addiction, Been Caught Stealing, When I Was Five, Funky R&B Legends, Cool and the Gang, Like Them, Lenny Kravitz, Oasis, Sinead O'Connor, Ozzy Osbourne, Sade, and A Tribe Called Quest. I'll get in... Uh into the the hall of fame it's a shame well, they're that, not getting it they're they're nom they're nominated, oh, they're nominated they have no. to vote right so yeah. there's about seven of them that are going to get in uh two-thirds of the names are nominating first sinead o'connor after she dies yes uh it's the second nomination for mary j blige eric bean rakeem jane's addiction david matthews band and a third for a tribe called quest um so and on the, the actual ballot the first ballot there was the white stripes and cindy lopper were there uh, but they did not make the cut. Well, the White Stripes were on the ballot in 2023, actually. Yes, and uh, they didn't make the cut, and uh, they did not get onto the ballot this year, and Cindy Lauper was also on the, on the 2023 ballot, and uh, she didn't get back on this year as well. Uh, so, yes, uh, the 2024 nominees will be decided by a voting party of about 1,000 or plus artists, historians, and members of the music industry, and uh, it seems that the ceremony will be live streamed on Disney Plus and air on ABC at a later date. Mm. So there you go. Um, you know what? Last year, I could kind of say pretty clearly who it was. Like there was almost like a a clear line between. Oh yeah, like like yeah, Pat get Pat Benatar is getting in mm -hmm. right. It's, this one's a little trickier because the fairy J. Blige didn't get in the first time. Yeah. Like that, I don't understand. No. At all. 
Um, a Tribe Called Quest, I also don't understand. I know. Total pioneers. Uh, Jane's Addiction also didn't. I would have thought that they would have been a shoe in I mean, they're not as well known in North America, though. That, that might be, have something to do with it. Well, they're, they're from Chicago. Yeah, but they seem to have been more popular in the UK for some reason. Oh, really? Yeah, huh. for some reason. That. Yeah, they they crossed more across to crossed over more more popular there than they were hmm. uh, in North America. And um, YK. But then you know, like, really? Because to, to be a nominee, you have to, it has to be at least 20, 50, 25 years since you put out your first commercial recording. Well, Cher has done that way longer than that. And this is her first mm-hmm. time ever nominated. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Pretty sure Mariah Carey is going to be a shoe in. I'd be surprised if she wasn't. Yeah. But the the rest of them? Who knows? It, it's a toss up, man. Mm-hmm. When when does the show air? Uh, is it in because they tape it and then air it later usually? Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Will be decided. It will be yeah. The class will be announced in late April. Okay. So we'll be keeping our ears on the ground for that, just to uh, see uh, see what's going on. Yeah. How long did it take for Rush? Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's let's talk. Um, That's true. Let's talk healthcare here for a sec. Uh, I have two things I want to show you. First off, I want to show you this thing from the Calgary Herald. I'll just blow it up so it's easier to read. Uh, and this is a really disturbing stat. I just saw this a few minutes ago. And when you see this, it'll make you go, oh my goodness. This is for the city of Calgary. Okay. Just the city of Calgary, not the province of Alberta. Calgary lost more than 20,000 healthcare social assistance workers in 2023. That's a staggering number. Staggering. When I scroll down, it's like, right, how many were fired or left due to mandates? Uh huh, yeah, sure. Yes, it was uh, pedophiles that Edmonton added. You are covering that horror story. Like, <laughs> some of the responses. Oh, God. Some of the responses. Are just, the answer to everything. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then the next one I want to show you is here. It is. So this is uh, from a person who goes by the handle of Talk Hard Nineteen. I don't know who this person is, but it's uh, a pretty disturbing image when you see it. And I'll bring it up here in a second. Here it is. So let me put this on the screen. It says. I'm posting this with permission from a dear friend of mine in the U.S. This is her bill. After three weeks in hospital with COVID and pneumonia, she had to be intubated. If we're not vigilant, this is exactly where the PC coordination will do. Scrolling slowly to see her bill for three weeks in the hospital. $672,605.88. Jeez. The highest number of bankruptcies in the United States of America occurred due to medical debt. Jeez. And that's where we're headed if we're not careful. Because now, through um, a large pharmacy chain owned by Galen Weston, you can pay $79.90 a month to see a doctor whenever you want. Wait a minute, that's a usury fee. Isn't that against the Health Canada Act? I'm not familiar enough with it. I know that the fees are for like certain things and uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I hope someone does challenging it, challenge it. Yeah. It's not a good road Um, we're headed down. If we're not ever vigilant, we need to push back against these uh, governments who just continue to cut our basic services to the bone and then bring in what they do is they break it. They break the public service and then bring in the private sector as a rescue, as a parachute. And suddenly, hey, they cut our taxes, but my costs have increased. So I'm no further ahead. I'm actually falling behind. And this is what happens. We cut your taxes. Yeah, but now I got to spend, you know, X number of dollars a month on uh, supplementary health insurance. Right. 
because I have to pay to see a doctor now because of what you did. Yep. I, I don't care that my taxes went up. My service fees don't exist. Then I'm happy. That's true. Um, speaking of health and other stuff about helping people, um, three quick hits here. But uh, the Canadian Dental Program you know, mm -hmm. registrations have started, and people are uh, you know, applying. And we're starting with people who are older uh, Canadians, and um, they are receiving letters. And they're being told when it is that they can register. And this started in December, I think. And we were looking at, um, we think we're starting at with the people who are 78 and older at first. And yes. Why not? Well, they're at the phase where they're about to send out letters to Canadians who are 72 and up now. And so far, 400,000 people have been approved the program so you know what we were wondering at first we started with 70 how many people are going to order that and go for that. turns out a lot turns out that there were a lot of seniors 400 000, that's 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 one percent of our population about if we kind of if we say we're at 40 million we're about to hit 41 but mm -hmm. this and these are people that are let's say 74 and above or 73 mm -hmm. and above there's a lot of, this is a good program. 400,000 people approved already. So um, starting in May, they will start to be able to get those services. Uh, Kitlin M goes, my husband applied for the dental care program. They'll let him know in two weeks if he's accepted. If so, he'll receive his packet of information by May. Exactly. So in May, you'll be able to um, start getting your services. And remember to qualify, you have to have no access to private insurance have filed last year's tax returns, and have an adjusted family income of less than $90,000. That's it. Mm. That's all you need to qualify. Um, the government also announced that, and this is something that's announced before, but they're doing it again, um, that the um, deadline for extending medical assistance and dying to people who have mental health issues has been uh, delayed, pushed back, Yet again, it seems that once again, uh, provinces are not ready uh, to be able to do what's needed to be done or provide the information that's needed to be provided in order to go forward with it. So uh, Minister Mark Harland, Holland announced that uh, we're not ready yet and we're going to uh, you know, delay it uh, for some time, which again is the right decision if you're not doing it. But we have to remember that at the heart of this, there's a human rights issue in that people who are mentally ill do still have the same rights as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And right now they are not being able to access a program that's being accessed by everyone else. And technically that is unconstitutional. Now I you know. need some rules and regulations and whatnot to make that happen. And things are much more complicated and complex yes. when we're dealing with people who have mental illness. Um, but there are ways to do it. I just, I'm, I'm really, I'm really uncomfortable with it. Yep. Yeah. It, it is uncomfortable because, you know, you don't want these decisions being made, for example, by someone who's schizophrenic, let's say, while they're having a psychotic episode. Right. But then you have to hope that you have a medical system that's good enough to recognize that someone's in a psychotic episode. And, you know, we can't do that right now. Right. You, you're not in a state to be able to make that position, that decision right now. But there are plenty of people who suffer from mental illness who have periods of time where they're doing quite well. Mm -hmm. And they're able to make their wishes known and all that type of stuff. So, um, but yes, there, there's a question whether or not made for mental health is too much of a political hot button because we would probably be uh, moving to the forefront of nations yes. having that type of policy. Uh, lots of policies that have that, that, lots of nations that do have some type of made policy, but I'm not sure how developed theirs uh, for mental health is. Well, I'm, you know, as somebody who has mental health issues, I, I really am not comfortable with where this is going. And I understand constitutionally that there's, they're going to have to examine the hell out of this. But here's my concern is that we're not giving people the proper treatment that they need. 
and I already took care of that, sir. Okay. Uh, we're not giving people the proper treatment that we need if they're looking at maid as an option. Because I just, can we not get proper counseling, proper medication? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we should spend some money on mental health care? Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. And, and exactly that's the other side of the coin, right? Are we you know, making this accessible because we don't want to do the hard work on the other side? Well, this is what it sounds like to me. Indeed. You know, and, and I know people who suffer who would choose that. And I'm like, I don't think that's the right way to go. Yeah. I, that's personal. And I'm getting personal here because of, you know, I suffered for decades. And I'm going to say right now, I probably would have chosen that route were it available to me at one point in time. Hmm. I'm, so this is why I don't think it should be something that should be, it's a difficult, it's, it's a hot button topic for sure. It's definitely a hot button topic. Um, uh, for the, those who are wondering what uh, the thing about uh, Mr. Grizzly already having dealt with that is uh, we had uh, someone in the chat who was being gross. Yes. So I just eliminated them. They're yes. blocked. Very gross and vile. Um, now they were, they were watching on, on a Twitter feed. I don't know which one. So, yeah. But, you know, just, we make enough good-hearted sex jokes that we do not need to have vile mm -hmm. sexual stuff. In well, and, and the there's, there's been some people recently that I've, I've uh, reported and banned on, on uh, comments on YouTube because they're just, I said, you know what, there's somebody the other day, and I, I told you about this, the individual yeah. was just coming back with one more hateful comment after another, not adding anything to the conversation. And I just said, you know, you had your chance. You never have anything positive or constructive to say. All you do is spew vile hatred. And that gets you, that gets you a ban. So yeah. I put that message. I left it up for about 10 or 15 minutes so that hopefully they got a chance to read it. Then I banned them. They're blocked. Yeah. And I reported them to YouTube for harassment. Yep, yeah. and we that, and that's the rule on the blog page too. Yeah, it's like you're free to say what you want, but like, let's not do yeah. sophistry. Let's not do insults. Let's not attack other people on the chat. Let's assume that everybody here is dealing in in good faith, and add something constructive. Mm -hmm. Whether you agree with the opinion stated or not, add something constructive. Because if you don't agree with it, it's okay. But put just... something. But you, know. you put something that you, where you turn around and say, yeah, I can see how someone who sees it would see it that way mm -hmm. or could see it that way. I don't, but I see. But if it's just, oh, well, you know, it's this conspiracy theory like this that nobody can see it that way, then, you know, right? Yeah. So uh, you, you have to be adding something. You have to be adding uh, something of value to the public square, even if you're being contrarian, right? And you can stay. We have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. It's not differing views we have problem with. We have problem with behavior. And that's the thing. You can come in here with a difference of opinion, and we're happy to, to have a debate with you about anything. But if you come in and spew hatred and yell and scream and, and make outlandish statements, I'm going to recommend that first you go seek counseling. And second, I'm going to tell you that I'm banning you because yes. we're not having hatred here. And then, and then somebody said, well, you, you say hateful things about Pierre all, uh, Paul F all the time. I go, um, that's not opinion. That's a fact. <laughs> we call him out for his lies and his bullshit. That's not it's an not, opinion. It's a fact. It's not hateful if it's true. It's not mean if it's true. It's a statement of fact. It might be an unflattering fact, mm -hmm. but it's still a fact. Facts are facts. They're not alternative facts. They're facts. Yep. End of story, period. That's it. Yep. Also on the, the wavelength of things being done, uh, Minister Mark Miller, minister, currently our Minister of Immigration, announced recently an extra $363 million in funding to address housing for refugees. Uh, he recently announced that about $100 million of that went to the province of Quebec. And uh, previously, before uh, Toronto City Hall finalized its budget, the federal government had also announced that there would be $143 million going to the Toronto area to help with their issues. Most uh, asylum seekers and refugees in uh, Canada do end up in the provinces mm -hmm. of Ontario and Quebec, so it's no surprise that the overwhelming majority of that $363 million would go to those two places. Um, 
But uh, yeah, there was just another announcement the other day. And uh, unlike other uh, places, uh, when it comes to housing funding, uh, Quebec is right there at the table. Yeah, yeah, give it to us. Uh, we're, we're ready to do what we wanted to, what we mm-hmm. need to do. Um, and they'll go ahead with it. Uh, that clip we showed of the prime minister with Doug Ford, uh, they were actually together to announce some money as well uh, in that case. And it was money going to tackle uh, guns and gang violence. Uh, Ottawa has committed $390 million to that fund and $121 million that is going to Ontario to combat auto theft. Because in 2022, there was one car stolen every 30 minutes, nearly 10,000 vehicles stolen in Toronto in 2022, which is about a 300% increase since 2015, according to the Canadian Finance and Leasing Association. Um, There's a dramatic rise in the number of auto thefts that are combined with a home invasion. Mm. Well, which is something that's not being uh, reported too much in the news there. Um, So, yeah. And there was also some more money uh, with that. There was a compliance and warranty apprehension grant of $100 million given to Ontario. And then this auto theft grant of another 121. And uh, the province of Ontario has announced that it's going to expand the Ontario Police College to uh, be able to pass 1,400 cadets through its system per year to 2,000 per year. And this all has to do or is somewhat connected with the National Summit to Prevent Auto Theft, which took place on February 8th, February 8th uh, that we talked about uh, very briefly uh, on our show uh, last week. So um, just uh, so I can see that, um, you know, the, the Prime Minister being there to uh, announce money. And I believe maybe that particular announcement has nothing to do with that. The particular announcement that um, Ford was there for is because the government of Ontario has finally signed on to the health care deal. That's been on the table since last year. And there's only like the fourth province to do it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of provinces are dragging their, are dragging their heels saying, we don't have the money. Like, well, the money's been sitting there. Well, let's, 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 but they did want no strings at first. So mm-hmm. I'm guessing they didn't quite get that. So did you know, um, Oh, maybe I'm not going to go there. No, I'm not going to go there. Not going to go there? Uh, no. Um, I'm going to talk to a friend to get specifics before I go where I was about to go because, um, yeah, that could put us literally in the crosshairs of, of uh, an organization that would not like us. So not going to say it. Um, but it has to do with car thefts and Pierre Polyev's um, suggestion that he'll hand over scanners to inspectors on docks to scan stuff. And, and I was going to tell you how that won't work because of individuals who are part of a well-known criminal organization who also run certain other organizations and yeah okay yep let's Let's just say more details let's just say pierre polyev's uh, scanner thing that would get tossed right off the dock into the harbor won't happen okay it's not gonna happen all right we have Kit Snow saying, very interesting show today, covering a lot of important topics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Grizzly, I think that's about all I have in terms of news at the moment. Well, I have I have one thing to add to it, and then we can wrap up, because I think this is something that we should be sharing. This is some um, good news about somebody doing something good. Now, this Ooh. is from uh, Justice Queen at RE underscore Market Watch. And I will show you this tweet, and I will read it to you. Whoops. And it says, How one Canadian tech millionaire built a tiny home community. Marcel Lebrun made millions as a software tycoon, then funneled his fortune into 12 neighborhoods, a planned community of 99 affordable tiny homes in Fredericton for the cities unhoused. And you can see some of the pictures of the, the, the homes and the community that he's built says various church groups stepped in with donations as well, the largest of which was the use of cavernous 8,000 square foot space, which would later serve as 12 neighborhoods manufacturing warehouse. 
LeBrun assembled his own his own 19 person team of carpenters and plumbers through online job postings and word of mouth, offering each worker a living wage of 20 to 30 dollars per hour. The team went through two or three home prototypes before settling on its current 240 square foot pine and metal model. And this is what he had to say. We have people who have been run over by trauma, by substance abuse, by all of these things. It's about excavating that person buried under their circumstances little by little. So this is a good man doing good work. Wow. The time when uh, we can use more of it. I've included a link there that we can put for the kits in the, the chat. There's an article in a McLean's magazine, February 5th, 2024, titled How One Canadian Tech Millionaire Built a Tiny Home Community. And uh, you can read up about him. Um, yeah, it might be hard. To, I'm going to try and see if I can find a, a contact for him. See yeah, see if we can him on the show. Just, if we can get him on the show, that'd be great. It's always a little trickier to find contacts for people who are subjects mm -hmm. in newspaper articles. But hey, uh, I'll try. I'll try to make a duty of that and uh, find that out because he would definitely have something interesting to say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, democracy is something that you do, right? Mm -hmm. He's doing well, it. And you know who pointed this to me? Uh, well, didn't point it directly to me, but but how I came across it is our friend Laura, Laura Babcock. Uh, she was the one who highlighted the story here. I'll just show this to you on the screen. Real leaders step up to meet the moment. Where are successful business people and developers who finance Mayor Andrea Horvath's campaign? Why aren't they working together to build shelter and transition people to housing first? It benefits economy and homeless people. Indeed. Indeed. And since we're speaking about Hamilton, uh, we have the Hamilton Helps petition. Mm -hmm. I think it's hamiltonhelps.org still. Not not sure what, there was something with the website going on at one point. So Kit Angela or Kit Leanne, if you're uh, on the chat today, remind us what uh, if there's been a change in website so that we can direct people. But uh, the Hamilton Helps petition to keep the armories open, please uh, give some time and a moment to uh, sign that. Um, what was that chat, that comment here? Run over by trauma. What a succinct way to phrase that. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely indeed. Yeah, it makes it makes me wonder if if he uh, if he personally experienced trauma earlier in his life or if he has a loved one or or you know for somebody to go out and do what he's doing I would tend to think that he's been directly affected somehow. Yeah. Usually that's often that is the case could be someone in his family as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So more along the way. Already so. Um yep, a couple of uh, good things, uh, little things to mention here. Uh, I forgot to do it when I when, when it happened, but uh, so I, an account I like to follow. His name is Jarvis Gugu, mm -hmm. G O O G O O, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I always get it wrong now when I'm saying talking about Mikma, because there's the pronunciation when we're talking about the person, and when you're talking about other things, I can never remember which is which. So I'm very very sorry if I'm gonna. Say it incorrectly, mm -hmm. um, but uh, he is of the culture. And uh, on January thirty first, he said, uh, posted a tweet tonight. Mi'kmaq people historically fed Apuk Apuknajit the winter spirit. It is the start of the lunar new year, and typically the prayers would be to thank Apuknajit for keeping you alive, warm, fed, and healthy up to this time, the middle of winter. You ask Apuknajit to help you in staying alive, warm, fed, and healthy for the remainder of the winter. Traditional offerings of food would be eels, fish, moose, etc. The time to feed is any time after dark and before midnight. So if we get the god awful weather the next month in Mi'kma'ki, I'm blaming whoever doesn't put food out tonight. <laughs> and you did kind of get that winter one thing. So <laughs> there might be a couple of people. Mi'kma. Yeah, Mi'kma. Like I said, I just I'm not sure just which which is which is which Migma or yeah, but I do have to look look it up because I do want to bring more stuff like that and make sure that I get it right. And of course, not too long ago, or I think it was like two nights ago, I think it was the Lunar New Year within the the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. So uh, for anybody who's uh, and everybody who's celebrating, just uh, wanted to bring that uh, Happy New Year. And I uh, hope that your celebrations were joyous, had lots of love, lots of family, lots of good eats, lots of song, lots of celebration, and uh, just some all-around good-naturedness. 
All right. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. And I, have, right. a little, I have a little Easter egg that uh, we talked about on Saturday that I said I would save and bookmark for today, which I have. We'll show you that in a few minutes. It's, All right. it's another piece of, of, uh, of positive news. Um, yeah, see it shortly. There we go. Um, and yes, thank you, uh, Kit Christian, for the, the pronunciation uh, trips. That it's Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq G and not a K, even though it's spelled with a K. Uh, you actually say it. Um, and then there was, uh, like I said, but I still want to um, know what is the word, because it might also be different between singular and plural and stuff as well. I don't know. A person and... But I will. I will ask. I, I will ask. I'll, I'll ask Bryson actually, and, and Jarvis, mm -hmm. yeah, to yes. get me up to uh, up to speed there, so I do it right, uh, because I do well, care about like doing it right. It. But I wanted to make sure make sure everybody knows that I actually don't know. So I don't. <laughs> we want to get it right, but we're going to make mistakes because we're human. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you loved listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. It helps us out a lot. Ah, thank you, Kit Christian. All good, homie. Peace to you too. Um, so yes, please tell your peeps and poops. And if you do not want to miss an episode, well, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. The fabulous, feisty, and fierce the Ray Girl, who sponsors our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. Or you just scan the QR code being underneath my chin right there. Take that your will bring down. you there. Yep. And that way when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it goes directly to your inbox. Also, if you'd like to support us in other ways, then you need to make like Kit Elaine and go to our YouTube page, True North Eager Beaver Media on YouTube and uh, play with all our buttons. Like, share, and subscribe. Lick them all. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> Lick the buttons. Make them yours. Become a subscriber. Uh, that helps us out a lot. And if you would like to help us in yet another way, uh, that QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head up there brings us to our coffee page where you can leave a donation to the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. And given that I've been promising it, uh, for a while now, as have, uh, I'm going to start here on, sure. um, I said, yeah, I'm going to start with Kit Leanne and Kit Angela, who both made donations soon after being on our show, which we thank you so very I'm much thanks. for. Uh, you definitely not don't need to do that, and there's no cost to be on our show, but we really do. It's not a condition, so kids know. <laughs> so you can be on the show so long as you donate afterwards. No, uh, it no, doesn't work no. that way. No. But uh, but thank you so much. And uh, Leanne uh, said, you deserve this, loves, as uh, she gives a donation. And uh, Kit Angela said, so thankful for all you do and sent us some hearts with that. Then we have uh, Kit Steve McLeod, who's uh, written this a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, recently joined uh, the Dam Fam. Said, just discovered you guys recently. I am hooked. Thank you for a layman's point of view political chat. Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Really I, I saw that. your email from, I think, yesterday. I just haven't had a chance to get to it. So I, I, I promise you I will. We'll respond later. Absolutely. Just lots to do today. Yes. and <laughs> And I have been flagging the emails so to, to make a note that i need to mention them and get back to you on them so we will we do pay uh, attention we're just yes busy. <laughs> we're just busy uh then we had kit diane send us a little something no particular message just a little love right then kit megan said thank you i like your work i do have a blue sky account for the record pnc bio uh i just can't remember what it is off the top of my head but um i i you're right. I've, I found almost no hatred there thus far. So I think it's just the way the algorithm works is that it, it keeps the hate away from you, it seems. And I found that was TikTok was the same way too. The way the algorithm worked, it would just attach like to like. And instead of uh, what has happened to Twitter, um, I, I only go to the For You page. I don't go following. Wait a minute. Which one? Hang on. Which one is it? It's the... Uh, yeah, the following page, not the for you page, because the for you page I find is just a 
cesspool of hatred. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Then we have uh, Kit Cassie that uh, sent us a little something at the end of January for a couple for a couple of hot chocolates to toast. A remarkable interview today with the senator and celebrate the success of your podcast where all points of view are welcome for civil discussion. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, dear one. Really appreciate that. We have Kit Vim send us something saying, I appreciate you so much. Kit MK, Mr. Beaver, one of my favorite things you say is, fight, fight, <laughs> fight, fight. I double over in hysteria every time. Takes me back to the 70s. Humor and spreading love will help us all heal. Much love to you and Mr. G. So there we Thanks, go. Eh? We have Kit there's, Queen's Kitty. There's my blue sky in the chat. If anybody's oh. interested. Oh, somebody scanned the QR code. Oh, cool. We have Kit Queen's Kitty. Keep being awesome and kind. Thank you. That is definitely the plan. Kit Janet goes, thank you for your podcast. I don't always get to watch live anymore, but I still watch every day. Lots of love to both of you with a big heart. Thank you, Kit Janet. We have Kit Rebecca said, thank you for your analysis while sending us a little something. Kit Cassie, once again, you are very, very good to us <laughs> because I want to support unbiased conversations about Canadian current events. Much love to you, lads. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. And catching us up to date, Kit Moondimon. Thank you. Thanks for your curation of Canadian news. It's the first thing I listen to when I start work in the morning. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. So, oh, and another scan of the QR code. Well, oh, wow. thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, yes, those are our, our thank yous that we needed to give, and a lot of them overdue for the, a lot of the tips that were sent to us. Thank you very much. There is still that wonderful letter that we received that I would like to read into the record at one point uh but this show has been long enough gone on yeah. long enough yeah. so uh from the beaver lodge this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there so please be kind to and gentle with yourselves mr grizzly some words of wisdom please and do you have an asmr by the way i do yes i just put up my my uh, right. qr code there uh, i will be doing a show this evening at 9 p.m I'm going to try and stretch it out a little bit longer. Last week I had to hurry because I had work to do afterwards, but I'm going to see if I can stretch it out a little bit longer. Anybody wants to join in 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that's uh, 7 a.m. if you're out in Alberta, 6, 7 a.m., 7 p.m. if you're in Alberta. Time time difference is not that much. 6 p.m. in uh, British Columbia. So that's Pacific uh, Mountain Central. And it's, you know, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Ontario, 10 p.m. Uh, Maritime, 10:30 in Newfoundland. So I understand if you're out east, it might be a little bit harder to tune in. But it's the reason I do it at that time is it was there was an opening in the schedule, and I thought that's you know towards the end of my day, I thought a nice time to just sit there and talk about mental health and how we can help each other out and some of the things I do to get me through the tough times when the tough times hit and the tough times do hit from you know on occasion. And hopefully they don't hit too often, but when they do, they hit hard. So I try and give you uh, a, a calming, soothing voice and a place to talk and chat where you can just, you know, you, you don't even have to express yourself in the chat. Some people just like to listen, and that's cool. I'm here to try and help you any way I can. And I will be in at 9 p.m. tonight. Yeah. All right. All right. Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits. Uh, let me find them. Oh, there they are. I, I got them right there. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's them. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. So I did uh, suggest earlier that I had a, a, a quick little uh, Easter egg that is uh, a nice thing. 
some positive words. And I'm going to put this on the screen and I'll read it out for those listening in. And this is from uh, Dan at Velo, uh, Velo Veritas. Mm. And Dan had this to say, we've been married for 31 years. We've never had kids. We've never collected social assistance. We've never collected EI. We're healthy. And yet, We are happy to pay our taxes so that kids have schools, vulnerable families have support, and healthcare needs don't lead to bankruptcy. And of course, we click on the image here. Number one, quality of life, and number three, best overall countries, Sweden, the kingdom of Sweden. Norway, number two in quality of life, number 11 in best countries overall. Canada, number three in quality of life, number two in best countries overall. We're doing okay, kids. Canada isn't broken. There are conservative premiers across the country that are trying to dismantle it, but it's not broken. So let's work together to, to keep it that way. Let's keep ourselves together. Yep. Let's keep working we have hard. A couple of broken people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if we work hard together, we can prevent any I more concur. breakage from occurring. All right. Yep. I'll I see concur. You. All right, kids. Go out there and have a beaverific day.